Okay. So let's start. So um, today I'm going to talk about Hindu symbols and veganism. And um, I'm specifically going to be addressing um, the symbolism that is relevant to veganism. And um, there are multiple interpretations of things. So I'm going to be choosing what I consider to be the most relevant ones. Okay, for invocation, let's start with Lord Ganesha. Uh, Lord Ganesha is a symbol for wisdom. And there are 10 aspects of Gan Lord Ganesha that indicate to us how we should be acting uh, if we want to be wise. So the eyes, Lord Ganesha is of course the head of an elephant, the body of a human being. And the eyes, the eyes of an elephant are far seeing. So you have to be far seeing if you want to be wise. Uh, the ears of an elephant are big. So which means that um, you can hear he can hear very well. So which means to be wise, you have to be able to hear others and what they are saying. The trunk of an elephant can break a branch of a tree or break a whole tree. And it can also pick up a peanut or a groundnut. So, it, so which means to be wise, you have to be able to look at the big picture and simultaneously also look at the finer details. The tusk of an elephant, I mean, the tusk of Lord Ganesha, you can see that one tusk is broken. So that is symbol, symbolic of the fact that you should know that no one is perfect. So even Ganesha is not perfect. But he also has a large belly. So which means that you also, you also have to know that you can rely on your own uh, intuition. You don't have to always listen to others and to what they say. Okay. Now he has an ax in his hand, in one of his hands, which is a symbolic of cutting off all attachments, cutting off all attachments to the output of what we are doing, to the results of what we are doing. He has a rope in another hand, which means with which he is drawing us to follow the path of Dharma. So you have to remember to follow the path of Dharma. Then the one of the hands is, uh, has this, it's called Abhaya Mudra, which means have no fear. So which is saying take courage when you do your work. And he has sweets in the other hand, which means the work that you do should be done as an offering to all. And finally, he his vehicle is a rat. So, which means think outside the box. So, because it seems like, you know, a rat could carry a big man like uh, Lord Ganesha, then anything is possible. So, this is why we invoke Lord Ganesha before we start anything, because it is a uh, invocation of how we should be, a reminder of how we should be dealing with the task that we are about to take on. So in the presentation today, I'm going to go through in four categories. First, we'll talk about gods and the symbolism of the gods. Then we'll talk about stories and symbolism of the stories. And then uh, third is festivals and the symbolism of the festivals. And finally, go through rituals and symbolism of rituals. So gods, of course, I showed you the symbolism of Lord Ganesha. So every god in the Hindu pantheon has such a symbolism of some aspect of um, life. So of course, uh, among the gods, you know, we have Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. So Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, and they represent the A, U, and M um in Aum. So Om, when you do Om, you start from A, ah, which is the sound that comes from our stomach and our uh, genitals. So it's really a, the sign of the creator, Brahma. U is the sound that comes from our heart. So that is the 
science, symbolism of Vishnu. And mm, when you do mm, the sound comes from our, our head. So that represents Shiva. So the Trinity of uh, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva represents our whole existence. Uh, they also represent the body, the mind, and the soul. So in all our rituals, we offer actually the body, our body, mind, and soul. We offer it to God. And um, so this, in essence, we are offering our whole self to God. Now, one of the foundations of Hinduism is the idea that God is always at work. So everything happens for the best. So God is always at, in play. So this is why if I were to summarize Hinduism in one sentence, it is let go and let God. So let go of your ego. So let go of the fruits of your action and let God, because it's, the, the assumption is that we cannot understand all of the implications of everything happening around in the universe. And we are given uh, a view into our own small circle. And so we don't understand why something may not work the way we want it to be, uh, but that doesn't mean it's incorrect. Now, the Trinity that we have, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, there, is a, there are feminine versions of them. So there is uh, Lakshmi, who is the counterpart of Vishnu. Parvati is the counterpart of Shiva and Saraswati is the counterpart of Brahma. And sometimes we use the feminine, sometimes we use the, ma the masculine version, um, almost interchangeably. And each of these are symbols of uh, how do you deal with wealth? So when you deal with wealth, that's Lakshmi, the wealth has to flow through you, cannot stay. Okay? And Saraswati is about creativity and arts and education. And Parvati is about fixing things, about making things better, getting things, um, you know, undoing the destruction that happened. Now, Nataraja is another interesting symbol of Shiva. And because Shiva is about the mind and controlling the mind, so he is the meditator. So it's uh, so basically he's a symbol of how we should be controlling our mind and uh, relying on meditation. So the Nataraja symbol, you can see that he has one hand pointing to his left foot and he's lifting up his left leg. So the left side of the body is really the, the side that is moving. That is the change in the universe. So he's pointing to the change in the universe. And then with his right hand, he's using the Abhaya Mudra sign. He's saying, don't be afraid of change in the universe. And then with his left, with his right foot, he's standing on this Smaran, which is a memory of something bad that, that we did. So we may have fallen off and we have stumbled in our, um, in our quest for spirituality, for uh, enlightenment. So we may have stumbled. So, so the memory of that takes, it takes about what, 30 days. So this, that's, represent, that's represented in these little flames all around. So about 30 days for us to repeat the same mistake again. So to overcome that and not have to repeat the same mistake again, we have to stand on our right side, which is our spiritual side, right? and rest, uh, rest on our spiritual side, which is our spiritual uh, with our heart, and not be afraid of the change and let go. So this is a symbol of how we deal with mistakes that we make on our way to, uh, towards enlightenment. Okay, so now let's get to stories because I have a lot of things to cover and um, I'm not going to go through in too much detail. All right, so let me start with the knowledge tree story that's in the Bible. I mean, uh, most people I talk to are already familiar with this story uh, in the Bible where there's an apple tree and Adam and Eve 
are um, Eve plucks the apple from the apple tree and because the serpent told her to, and then she persuades Adam to do the same thing. And they both eat the apple from the apple tree and God banishes them from Eden. So this is the story of separation that we know from the Bible. Now it turns out that there is an exact equivalent story in the, from pre-Vedic times actually. And here it is not a, an apple tree, but it is a fig tree. And the role of Adam and Eve is played by children and the role of um, the serpent is played by a rich uncle. So, and I, it's a very in, interesting story and I think it is one of the, of, it's one of the foundational stories of Hinduism. And this story helped me understand the knowledge tree story in the Bible. So that's why I, I, I think it's important for us, all of us to understand the story. So in this story, the, um, the children, are in a hut in the middle of the forest and they are playing with sticks and stones and rag dolls on the floor of their hut. And their uncle comes to visit them. And their uncle says, why are you playing with sticks and stones when the cosmic fig tree is right outside your hut? Okay, so go out under the tree and wish for anything you want and it will give it to you. It's a wishing tree. Children don't believe him. How can there be a tree? where you wish and it gives it to you. That's not how the universe is built. So they wait until the uncle leaves and then they rush to the tree and they start wishing. They wish for sweets and they get them and they gorge on the sweets and they get stomachache. They wish for toys and they get them and they play with the toys and they get bored. Then they wish for fancier toys and that leads to greater boredom. So there was something about this tree that they did not understand. It grants you what you wish for, and along with it comes the exact opposite. The children didn't know that. All they knew is that they couldn't stop wishing under the tree, and the more they wished, the more miserable they were. Then they get to be young men and women, and now they're wishing for what young men and women wish for. The three main fruits, the, the four main fruits of the tree were sex, fame, money, and power. And with each comes its opposite, and the result was more misery and suffering for the young men and women. Then they get to be old men and women, and they congregate under the tree in three different groups. The first group says, you know, we were so happy when we didn't know about this tree. It has all been a hoax and a farce. And the story says they were fools, for they, under they hadn't understood this tree. The second group says, we must have been wishing for all the wrong things. If we could go back and wish for different things, I'm sure we'd have been a lot happier. And they were bigger fools, for they'd understood less than nothing about this tree. And the third group was the most foolish of the lot, but they come under the tree and they say, we are so miserable, we wish you were dead. And the tree grants them the wish. And they're immediately reborn underneath the same tree, because the tree always grants wishes and dualities. So meanwhile, a lame child had been watching all this from inside the window of the hut. He also wanted to go out and wish for a good leg so he could walk. But there was such a crowd of people thronging under the tree that he couldn't get through. So he stood there and he watched, but he saw how the tree was making everybody miserable. The children were miserable, the adults were miserable, the old people were miserable. The People who were wishing were miserable. The people who were trying to get to the tree were miserable. And the, all the animals were suffering because of all the wishing. And then he had a brilliant flash of insight. He understood the tree. He was the only one who understood the tree. And with that understanding, he began to feel a well of compassion come from within him for all the suffering under the tree. And he'd lost the desire to wish. He became detached from the tree. And with that combination of compassion and detachment, he was the happiest of the lot. So that's where the story ends. And then we know we have these Upanishads where they, where they teach you what they told you in the Vedas, right? So in one of the Upanishads, this Shweta Shweta Upanishad, 
they say that that um, wishing child and the watching child are inside each one of us. That's our duality. And it, the purpose of meditation is to help us get in touch with our watching child so that we can observe our own wishing child and to observe other wishing children around us and be compassionate and detached to them. So that makes it seem like in order to be happy, you need to step away from the universe and just stay with your watching child, just observe. And so that question comes up in the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita actually, the Mahabharata, is a dialogue between uh, Lord Krishna and Arjuna. And Arjuna's main question was, why should I wish under the tree? Why should I wish under this cosmic fig tree, this knowledge tree? Why don't I just stay somewhere and meditate upon you and I'll be perfectly happy? So he said, you are God, so you take care of the problem. And Lord Krishna said, no, you have to wish under the tree. So how do I think I, how do you think I do my work? Through you. So you have to go wish under the tree. And then he taught him how to wish. So he said, you know, the people who were going there and wishing under the tree, they were unhappy because they were wishing for themselves. If he could go under the tree and he wished for the benefit of everyone else, and he say, I don't want anything from this tree for myself, then you'll be perfectly happy wishing under the tree and everybody will be happy because of your wishing. So you have the right to action and you have to act, but not to the fruits of your action. That's what it means to wish under the tree without seeking any benefit for yourself. And so that is actually the, the dilemma we face today in the world. It's exactly the same dilemma. And it helped me understand the knowledge tree story in the Bible because Adam and Eve got banished because they ate the fruit of the apple tree themselves. So if they had eaten the, if they had given the fruit to someone else, if they had used that for the benefit of others, then I don't think they would have been banished, right? So, but then again, everything happens for the best. So all of the wishing that we have done under the knowledge tree, which has caused all this destruction, has had some benefit. And so we are now being called to wake up and start wishing for the benefit of every other species and not for our own species. All the stories in the Mahabharata have tremendous symbolism and there is so much wisdom encoded in these stories. The story of Krishna, where Krishna lifted a mountain with his little finger and he sheltered the people of Goku underneath the mountain. The symbolism is that if you have faith in Lord Krishna, he will protect you from the trials and tribulations of, all, of life, of daily life. So it's meant to be a symbolic story. It's not meant to be taken literally. You know, we are not supposed to go and try to lift mountains with a little finger. Similarly, Lord Krishna um, overcame Kaliya, the seven-headed snake, and he was found dancing on the hood of a seven-headed snake, playing on his flute. This is also a symbolic story. It's not meant to be taken literally. There are no seven-headed snakes around. But the seven-headed snake represents the seven chakras that have to be opened. And to overcome those chakras, to open those chakras, you have to overcome fear, guilt, shame, grief, lies, delusions, and finally attachments. And so those are the seven holes of the flute that have to be opened. So when you open those seven holes, then Lord Krishna can play beautiful music through the flute. So that's why he's shown playing the flute because he's enlightened. He's playing um, with, with, a, with a flute that has all holes opened. So this symbolism is a symbolism of Krishna's enlightenment that he's overcome the seven chakras and it's not meant to be taken literally. It's a symbolic story. In the same way, Krishna loving butter is a symbolic story. See, milk is the fluid mind that has doubts about God. To milk, you add curd, which is the thought of God, 
and you let it curdle. Then you churn that curd and you will get butter. So butter is now the solid mind that has no more doubts about God. It is the mind of a devotee of Lord Krishna. This is why Krishna loves butter. He loves the mind of a devotee. He loves devotees. Then you take that butter and you clarify it. You get clarified butter, which is ghee. This is why we use ghee in our lamps during our prayers to light the lamps because the ghee represents enlightenment. It is the clarified solid mind that has no more doubts about God. It's the clarified mind of a devotee, which is an enlightened mind. So we selectively, in our, in our marketing, we selectively take this particular story of Krishna and use it literally, whereas the other stories we take, we know it's symbolic because we don't really try to lift the mountain with a little finger or dance with the hood of a seven-headed snake. But for the butter, we go and eat it right? because Krishna ate it. Now, the, both the Pandavas and the Kauravas, if you look at the origin of the Pandavas and the Kauravas in the Mahabharata, you will see the symbolism starkly you know, defined there. Because the Pandavas were born to Kunti and Madri, and they were born to uh, King Pandu. Well, King Pandu was no, not responsible for the Pandava brothers, actually. In fact, King Pandu, the story goes that he was out hunting in the forest, and he accidentally shot a Brahmin and his wife in the, in the act of copulation. And they were both dying. And as they were dying, King Pandu was horrified that he thought he was shooting a deer and instead he shot this couple. And so he was horrified. And as they were dying, the Brahmin cursed King Pandu and he said, if you ever um, have sex with your wives, you will die. So from that point on, King Pandu just meditated in the forest for the rest of his life. So Kunti was shocked that her husband was no longer there with her. So, but she remembered that she had a boon. She had five boons left because she had gotten six boons before during, um, during her childhood. So she had five boons left. And so she used three of those boons, one with Lord Dharma, one with Lord uh, Vayu, and one with Lord Indra. And with Dharma, Vayu, and Indra, she got Yudhishthira, Bhima, and Arjuna as sons. And then she gave the other two boons to Madri, and Madri prayed to the Gemini twins, and she got Nakula and Sahadeva. So Yudhishthira is the son of Dharma, Lord Dharma, so he represents justice. Bhima is the son of Lord Vayu, he represents strength. Arjuna is the son of Lord Indra, so he represents courage. So it's justice, dharma, courage, I mean, dharma, strength, courage, and then Nakula and Sahadeva are from the Gemini twins, and they represent kindness and compassion. So that's the symbolism of the Pandava brothers. And Draupadi is symbolic of the Kundalini. So which means as we open the seven chakras, she allows us to get to enlightenment. So the whole story of Mahabharata is the story of how an individual can get to enlightenment. It is also, since it's an epic, it also reveals the truth in other, at other levels too. Okay, it's not just for an individual, but also from a societal level, it reveals the truth. So that's the origin of the Pandavas. Now the Kauravas, the Kauravas are born to Dhritarashtra and Gandhari. Dhritarashtra is the brother of Pandu. Dhritarashtra was a blind king. So he was blind. And so Gandhari, when she married Dhritarashtra, decided to blindfold herself. And then she um, had a two-year pregnancy, at the end of which she gave birth to a big lump of flesh. So she was horrified when she gave birth to a big lump of flesh after two years. So she prayed to Lord Vyasa and said, you know, what is this? And so Vyasa came and he said, so what do you want? And Gandhari said, I want sons. I want a hundred sons. And you, I was born, I mean, I was given this big lump of flesh instead. 
So Vyasa then cut up the flesh into 101 pieces, not 100. And so he said, you cannot have just sons, you should have at least one daughter. So 100 sons and one daughter put them on Matsya leaves and they became the Kaurava brothers and the one sister. Sister is Dushala. So the symbolism is that if you have a disciplined mind like King Pandu and a discriminating intellect um, like Kunti and Madri, then you will have the five good characteristics like Dharma, justice, courage, um, strength, kindness, and compassion. But if you have a blind mind like the Dhrashtra and you blindfold your intellect, so you really don't even dis you know, question the blind mind and let it run loose, you will have 101 demons running inside you. Uh, every possible characteristic or negative characteristic is among the Kaurava brothers. Uh, Duryodhana represents material desire. And so all of these bad characteristics will show up in us. The, and then the battle of the Mahabharata is a battle between our good and our bad side. This is the duality within us. And so the dialogue of Lord uh, Krishna with Arjuna is the dialogue of God with courage. So God is persuading our courage to fight the battle, to fight the battle and to overcome our material desires and search for enlightenment. And without courage, none of the other virtues are useful. So this is why he talks to Arjuna, who represents courage. And there are some very interesting characters in the Mahabharata who have uh, symbolism. Dronacharya is the teacher of both the Pandavas and the Kauravas, but he fights on behalf of the Kauravas. So you must, you, you ask, you know, why is the teacher of the Pandavas fighting for the Kauravas? Why is he a bad guy? Well, Dronacharya represents traditions and custom because that's what he's transmitting from generation to generation. And so the idea is that if you follow traditions and customs blindly, without question, you're going to be fighting for the demons. You're going to be fighting on the bad side. So you always have to question your customs and traditions. Every generation has a responsibility to renew their customs and traditions. This is why all of our epics uh, were passed by word of mouth, because they were living, breathing epics. You know, they changed from generation to generation. It's only recently that we started writing it down. And then once you write something down, it gets stuck in that uh, mode. And Drona and Duryodhana represents material desire. So he's the one who is seeking to just pleasure himself. So this is our material desire. And Karna is an interesting character in the Mahabharata because he's the eldest brother of the Pandavas, really. Because when Kunti received her boons, she just tried it out uh, with the sun god. And she was shocked that she got the boon and she got a baby. And she said, I'm not even married and I have a baby. So she put the baby in a boat and sent him up adrift, right? So Karna is the son of the sun god. And so he represents the desire for enlightenment. And he fights for the Kauravas because the desire for enlightenment is also a desire. It's an impediment to enlightenment. Okay, so we have to let go of that desire as well if we truly want to become enlightened. So uh, I won't go too much into the Ramayana, which is like a Ramayana is, is sort of a, uh, is a simpler version of the Mahabharata. You'll see very similar origin stories in the Ramayana, you know, where um, King Dasharatha is again, you know, going into the forest and he is hunting for a deer, just like Pandu was hunting for a deer. And Pandu shot a Brahmin and his wife in the act of copulation, but Dasharatha um, shot, uh, shot the son of Shravana, right? He, she shot Shravana and he killed him. And, uh, and this is why the curse that Dasharatha got was that your son is going to disappear. This is why, you know, Rama disappeared, right? That Rama went away from Dasharatha. So the stories are very, the symbolism is very similar. Ravana represents our material desires, our desires, because this is why every time you cut off a head, a new head is born. 
So every time you satisfy a desire, a new desire is born. So if you are seeking happiness through satisfying desires, you will never be able to satisfy them completely. So Sita represents our soul, who's imprisoned by desires. And uh, Lakshmana represents our body. And um, Hanuman, Lord Hanuman represents our disciplined mind. So with the help of a disciplined mind and a body and a soul devoted to God, you can reach enlightenment. You can overcome your material desires. This is how we overcome Ravana within us. Then let's get to festivals. So festivals seem to are the festivals are a way in which we kind of renew our understanding of these stories. So we do that um, on a regular basis. So let me talk about Vijay Jashmi, which is one of the favorite stories of my of my granddaughter. Um, so I tell her a vegan version of this because she's been raised as a vegan. So anytime I tell her a story in which there is any fighting and killing, she just objects to it. She wants to know why people are being killed or why even animals are being killed. The story of Vijay Dashmi is a story of this um, Mahishasura. So Mahishasura is this bad demon. I mean, he uh, actually got, he, he, he meditated for a long time, he prayed to Lord Brahma and he got this boon that he can never be killed by any man. No man can hurt him. So because uh, no man could hurt him, he became arrogant and he started destroying the planet and he started destroying, killing animals. And he had 16,000 wives. He started imprisoning all the animals, all the people. And so he was a really bad demon. So finally, um, the, uh, everyone got tired of him and they went to Lord Krishna, um, uh, Lord Vishnu and said, please take care of this man. You know, he's killing us. And Lord Vishnu said, no, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, because no man, Brahma has given him a boon that no man can hurt him. And then Lakshmi was sitting there and she said, you know, I'm a woman, so I can go down and to the earth and take care of him. So she comes to earth and she fights him and you can see her sitting on this. Uh, she comes in the form of Durga, actually, Parvati, Durga. So it's, you know, different versions of this use different characters. But so she fights him and she defeats him on the 10th day. Uh, so in the vegan version, I say, you know, he, she, she puts him in a headlock and then Mahishasura says, Oh, no, no, I'll change my ways. I didn't realize that I could, be, I could be defeated by a woman. So please let me go. And then so she lets him go. And then he regenerates the earth and brings him back to life. And so he undoes all the damage that happened. And then he becomes uh, a good person. So that's the story I tell my granddaughter. But in the story that we use for Vijay Dashmi, he gets killed and therefore you know, the earth is freed from his terror. So the 10 days of Vijay Dashmi represents the 10 characteristics that we are overcoming. Um, and I use uh, fear, guilt, shame, greed, lies, delusions, attachments, um, selfishness, greed, and apathy. as the 10 characteristics that we are overcoming. Now Deepavali also is, a, has, is very symbolic. Deepavali is the story, there are several versions of it told. So the, one of the versions is the um, uh, story of Narakasura. Narakasura is a, again a bad demon who goes around being arrogant and he's, he's more powerful than even the gods and he goes around uh, destroying the planet and um, being unkind to everyone. Um, and when he goes on, cuts off the ear, ear lobe of uh, Aditi, the mother goddess, she goes to Lord Krishna and says, please take care of him. And Lord Krishna says, sorry, you know, he has a boon that only Mother Earth can, can kill him. No one else can kill him. And he knows that he was born of Mother Earth. And he knows that no mother will kill her baby. This is why he's so arrogant. 
so I cannot do anything about it. But then, you know, Satyabhama, his wife, sort of pleads with him and says, please go down and take care of him. He's really destroying everything. So Lord Krishna comes and he fights with him, with Narakasura. And then Narakasura um, throws a weapon at Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna just falls down and he's just like dead. And Satyabhama gets very angry when she sees that. She takes, um, takes a weapon and throws it at Narakasura and kills him. And as he was dying, Narakasura realizes that Satyabhama was really Mother Earth. And so she got angry because he killed Lord Krishna and that's why she killed him. And then Lord Krishna wakes up because he was only pretending to be asleep. He was pretending to be dead. Because she, he wanted Lord Satyabhama in Satyabhama to kill Narakasura. And that's why he was going through this Leela. So that's the story of Deepavali. And again, it's a story of enlightenment. How do you overcome your material desires and reach enlightenment? So you're, um, the four days you're overcoming the four main fruits of the cosmic victory, you know, the um, uh, sex, fame, money, and power. Overcome your, de overcome your desires for those four. And on the fifth day, you overcome your desire for enlightenment. And so then we light our lamps. So that's the story of enlightenment. And in all of our religious festivals, we use milk sweets, animal foods are given. And it's not just in the Hindu tradition, it's in the Muslim tradition, in the Christian tradition, in every tradition, it seems like it's always religious festivals, religious festivals are associated with animal foods. And you ask, why is that? And in the early uh, 20th century, actually in 1931, when Mahatma Gandhi was visiting London, he gave a talk at the London Vegetarians Union. And in his talk, he said, I tried to go vegan several times. He didn't use the word vegan, of course. He said, I tried to give up my milk several times and every time I've failed. And once he actually went without milk for two years, okay? And, um, but at the end of two years, he became very weak. And when he went to his doctor and the doctor said, well, drink some milk. And he drank the milk and he got better. So he realized that he has to drink milk. So he started drinking goat's milk. He struggled to go vegan. And I was wondering, how can, how can Mahatma Gandhi, who had so much, such tremendous self-control, how come he had difficulty going vegan and millions of us are going vegan today? How could that be? Then I realized it is the vitamin B12 story. See, vitamin B12 was, no, was responsible for what was known as pernicious anemia. People used to get pernicious anemia. And by eating a little bit of animal foods, they could overcome the pernicious anemia. Uh, or my granddaughter's uh, tribe in South Phoenix, so she is one quarter American Indian and one quarter African American and half Indian. Um, so her tribe in South, in South Phoenix, called the Autumn tribe, so they are actually, they were a vegan tribe. They pretty much were all farmers. So they used to farm in this area and they used to farm corn, squash, um, and beans. And they used to eat that. And that's basically their main dish. They used to then go and take cactus fruits and eat that too. So they were mainly um, vegans. And then I found out that they had a ritual where once a month they would um, they would eat some soil. Every one of them would, would get together and they would pray to the creator and then they would eat some soil as part of the ritual. And that's how they got their vitamin B12. But most other people were getting their vitamin B12 through animal foods because we are the only species that washes its food before eating. So we wash off all the soil and we don't eat the soil. And it's only through soil that you can get vitamin B12 because it's chromium built into soil. I'm sorry, cobalt built into soil. And vitamin B12 was discovered only in the 1940s. It was isolated by Dorothy Hodgkin in 1965 and she won the Nobel Prize in 1964 for discovering the structure of vitamin B12. And that enabled its industrial production. This is why veganism was possible after the 60s and 70s, because we knew about vitamin B12 and we could take supplements. 
and make sure that we don't fall ill for not taking enough cobalt in the body. So because we thought that milk was essential for our survival, which, is, which was true then, because we didn't know it was because of vitamin B12, we created all these myths about milk. So we had the myth that milk is nectar, okay? And milk is ahimsa, because we really did take care of the cow and, and we were using the, the male cow to plow the field, but the female cow was being, taken, was being uh, used to produce new bulls and, and also to uh, supply us with some milk for our consumption. And then it was part of this sustainable uh, agriculture, so we thought milk is sustainable. Now, all of those myths are no longer true. So those traditions and cultures are no longer true. Milk is not nectar. It's poison today. And I'll show you why it's poison. Milk is a, not ahimsa. It is himsa. It is the cruelest thing you can do to an animal today to extract her mother's milk, the mother's milk and use it for our purposes and prevent the baby from getting it. It is the cruelest thing we can do. Uh, in fact, a mother cow, you know, not only loses her baby four, five times, then she is put to a machine and, and we suck the milk out of her in one minute flat, which is painful. Okay? And we do this like three times a day. And, and then after using her for four to five years, we then chop her up and turn her into hamburgers. So it's, this is the worst thing you can do to a mother. And milk is not sustainable, it is completely unsustainable. In fact, the burning of the Amazon is for cattle production. So the Amazon is now burning for cattle production. And India has so many cows because people are eating so much milk and not only milk, they're eating so much cheese every day that uh, it has become completely unsustainable. And it's actually a lot of people are lactose intolerant, so-called intolerant. Well, lactose intolerant to me, it should be lactose normal. This is normal for us to be intolerant of lactose because we are already weaned. We are not a baby anymore. As adults, we shouldn't be absorbing lactose in our body. But if you look at the percentage of people that are lactose intolerant or lactose, uh, lactose normal, there's a large percentage in the global south. It's only in the global north that you have a um, lot of people who are tolerant of uh, who were able to digest lactose. So now they have imposed their foods on us. Okay. So which means they are made, you know, cheese pizza and um, hamburgers and things like that. We are eating in the global south, which are really foods that are meant for these people here. And, and, and it's really not good for us. It's not good for the people in the south because we get sick. And we have this calcium myth, only milk has calcium, which is not true. Uh, lots of plant foods have calcium and they have more calcium than milk. In fact, chia seeds have almost six times as much calcium as milk. And I have a whole list of uh, foods on our website. If you go look under climatehealers.org um, slash info, if you look under the info tab, you will see um, a whole page on calcium. Similarly, the myths about protein, that only protein is only found in, me, on, in meat. In fact, it's found in everything. Protein you know, is, is part of every, the building block of life, right? It's part of everything that we eat has protein in it. Uh, in fact, there are lots of plant foods that are more protein than, than beef uh, for the same number of calories. So like broccoli stalks have 10.6 grams of protein for 100 calories, whereas beef is 9.2 grams. The reality of animal foods today is that animal foods have become a vehicle for delivering toxic chemicals into our bodies. So in the human experiment, which is the first documentary we did at Climate Healers, uh, we showed that we are currently through our industrial processes, we are producing and pouring about 250 billion tons of toxic chemicals into the environment every year. That's 250 billion elephants worth of toxic chemicals every year they're pouring into the environment. Uh, 
And those chemicals don't go away. A lot of them are uh, persistent organic compounds. So they stay in the environment and they get absorbed in the plants. They're eaten by animals. And the animals then concentrate those toxins in their bodies. And then we eat animal foods. When we eat animal foods, we get concentrated doses of those toxins in our food. And then we get sick. And then we get sick, we get chronic diseases. And then the pharmaceutical company uh, treats us or gives us medicines and pharmaceutical procedures, health procedures to make money off of us. So every step of the way, the industries are making money off of our ignorance in this issue. So the toxins are making money, the animal foods are making money for the corporations, the diseases are making money. So we are really being factory farmed uh, to create a revenue stream for corporations through animal foods. Animal foods also promote injustice. I mean, the direct injustice to the animals, it's, it's unspeakable cruelty that we are doing to animals. And then we wonder why is the planet dying around us? You know, It's crazy what's, what we are doing. It's we're killing more animals in four to 12 hours than all the humans that ever died in wars throughout human history put together with a billion animals every four to 12 hours. So, so if you watch the movie uh, Earthlings or Dominion, you will see exactly how animals are being processed for all the products that we buy, all the animal products that we buy. So that's speciesism is built in to animal agriculture. And then colonialism is built in. So when we see forests being burned down to graze animals or to raise, to grow crops for animals. Well, who gave permission for the forest to be burned down? It was the dominant culture that gave permission for the forest to be burned down. And there were people living in the forest and they were being told that their culture is inferior to the dominant culture. And therefore they have to make room for the dominant culture to come and burn down the forest. That is the definition of colonialism. So animal foods embody colonialism, built in, right? And it has racism built in. I mean, in the, in the US, there is a documentary called The 13th, which talks about how slavery uh, was supposedly abolished in 1865, but it really continued. And the way it continued was that they put a clause in the 13th Amendment saying that uh, if people are imprisoned for being criminals, they can be used as slaves literally as slaves. So we then created laws and we selectively threw colored people in jail. So the jails are filled with colored people and then we made them do work for us for free or literally free. So it's literally slave labor. So they get paid like 40 cents um, a day for doing labor and they are making hamburgers, they're making furniture. They make All these corporations have have tie-ins with the prisons so that they can get um, their factories run with slave labor. So if you buy a 99 cent hamburger at McDonald's, it comes from slave labor because the hamburgers were being created in a prison factory. So it represents racism and it represents uh, sexism and patriarchy. It is, I mean, everything we do to animals, we are doing to the feminine of the animal is the feminine that's being abused. So when you then go and abuse the feminine of the animal as a man, and then you come home, you're going to abuse the woman as well when you're home. So, so patriarchy is built into animal foods. And finally, let me talk about rituals. The arati is a symbolic of enlightenment. But enlightenment is seeing reality as is. Seeing reality without any blinders on. Okay, that's what enlightenment truly is. Now, if you really see what we are doing with the arati, we see that we're using clarified butter, which contains all these toxic chemicals that I told you about, dioxins and other lipophilic toxins. So when we are burning that, we are saying, God, here is some dioxin for you. Do you like that? So it's not really symbolic of an enlightened mind anymore. Ghee is no longer symbolic of an enlightened mind. In fact, it's symbolic of a mind that's completely unenlightened. 
Okay. Whether you're doing it for Aarti or for uh, Agnihotram, it's the same problem. The ghee is highly contaminated today and cannot be used anymore. Now it turns out that in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna actually said, if, offer, if you offer me with love, a leaf, a flower, a fruit, or some water, I will accept it. Okay? And so this is the kind of puja we normally do. So we have a leaf, betel leaf, which represents our body. We have flowers, which represents our mind thinking of God. And then we have fruits, which represents our soul. So we offer a body, mind, and soul to God. And then we break a coconut for the water. So the coconut is our ego. When we break the coconut, we are breaking the ego and out spills the water, the coconut water, which is the fluid mind that has doubts about God. And what is left is the coconut fruit, which is the solid mind that has no more doubts about God. So if you take the coconut fruit and you clarify it, you get coconut oil, which is the clarified solid mind that has no more doubts about God. And coconut oil can then be used in our arati to signify enlightenment. And coconut oil is one of the purest substances that we can find today because a tree or any plant filters the water that it's drawing through its roots. So it filters the water all along the way. And the coconut tree you can see is very, very tall. So it's, being, it's filtering the water all the way up. And by the time it gets to the coconut, it's as pure as it can be. This is why coconut water was used as a substitute for plasma during the world wars. Okay? So coconut water is pretty pure. Coconut itself is very pure. So the coconut oil will be one of the purest substances you can get today for lighting lamps. So I'm recommending that we veganize our rituals uh, and start using coconut oil instead of, instead of ghee. So this vegan transformation that's happening, this is really the Mahabharata story. This is the story of, uh, of the Kauravas, which are all about material desire and material pleasure and the other side, which is relinquishing material desire and material pleasure and saying we want to help the whole planet. So this is the greatest transformation in human history that's happening as the vegan movement grows and it's growing exponentially, okay? So the number of vegans in the US increased by a factor of seven between 2014 and 2017. Now, if you keep increasing at the factor of seven between 2017 and 2020, it will increase by another factor of seven by 2023, it will be a factor of 49. And by 2026, it will be a factor of 343. Which means that if even one third of 1% of the people were vegan in 2017, 100% of the people will be vegan by 2026. If we just maintain the same exponential growth. So this is the transformation that's happening. And I think this is the greatest transformation in human history. Because we are going to transform and thrive instead of going extinct. And in, from a system of normalized violence, we're going to go to a system of normal non-violence. And from being a predator species for the planet, killing more than a, you know, killing a billion people every four to 12 hours, we're going to become a caretaker species that regenerates forests and brings back the animals. And so I think we deserve a new name because right now we call ourselves homo sapiens, which is very arrogant because when you call yourself wise, that's what sapiens means in Latin then you're being arrogant. And there is no arrogant person who can ever be wise. So it's actually stupid to call ourselves homo sapiens. So I'm suggesting we call ourselves homo ahimsa. Ahimsa is a characteristic of us. So that's who we are going to become, a homo ahimsa. And from speciesism, colonialism, racism, and patriarchy, we're gonna to move to veganism and radical equality. And from diseases and divisions for humanity, we're going to move to health and unity for humanity. This has to become normal. Health has to be normal. Right now we are persuading our children to eat foods that will give them diseases as they grow up. Okay, that's really what we're doing. We persuade them to drink a lot of milk so that they get diabetes when they grow up. So then the pharmaceutical companies can give them diabetes medication. So we have to get rid of that system and start doing things for our own, uh, for our benefit as opposed to uh, for the benefit of corporations. From destruction and pollution of the planet, we're going to go to remediation and regeneration of the planet. 
And from death and cruelty to animals, you're going to show love and kindness to animals. And from a culture of consumption, which is really the core of our society, the culture of consumption, looking for material desire, you're going to go to a culture of compassion, which is the part of our society, a culture of love for all. And from a mindset of scarcity, which is pushing us in this current economy, <coughs> you're going to go to a mindset of abundance. And from a money-driven economy, you're going to move to a service-driven economy. And finally, I'd say, and now from the Libra currency that Facebook is proposing to uh, launch next year, uh, we are working on a different currency called Aquarius, which will embody all of these things on the right-hand side, because Libra embodies all of these things on the left-hand side here. <coughs> so to me, the Aquarius currency would be the currency for the transformation that will achieve a human earth animal liberation, which is to me heal. So a humans, earth, animals, love, that's also heal. So this is climate healers. But we must choose to transform. So even in the Bhagavad Gita, after giving him all that advice, Lord Krishna tells Arjuna in the 18th chapter, he says, I love you so much that I set you free even from me and you're free to choose. You're free to choose whether to fight the battle or not fight the battle. And we also have that choice as a species, as individuals, we have a choice to transform or not to transform. And we must choose to transform if you want to see this happen. We have a conference about this in uh, October uh, in Mesa, Arizona, Vegan World 2026 conference. So if you go to veganworld2026.org slash conference, you'll find details about registering and you're welcome to come and join us. I'm also going on a tour with uh, Thomas Jackson, the uh, producer of the movie A Prayer for Compassion. So A Prayer for Compassion looks at uh, veganism from every religious angle. And so we're going to be doing a tour in India in November. So it's called the Compassion in Action Tour. And that starts on November 4th in Chennai, and it ends on December 3rd in, in Mumbai. So that's where I'm flying out of. So if you want to request an event in your city, please email me at this address, srobertclementhealers.org, and I'd be happy to um, consider that. So thank you very much. And let's uh, get to questions. So you can find um, more of the facts at climatehealers.org slash facts. And uh, I've written a couple of books, Carbon Dharma and Carbon Yoga. Both are available on Amazon, or you can read them online at climatehealers.org slash books. Uh, we also have a small booklet called Meet the Metocracy, which talks about the system change. And then I've done a number of webinars. Uh, this will be the eighth webinar that I've done. And the previous seven webinars can be watched at uh, I'm sorry, this will be the ninth webinar I'm doing. So the previous eight webinars, can you can see them at climatehealers.org slash webinar. So thank you very much. And let me now take a look at the chat to see what, if you have any questions. Um, let me also stop the sharing so we can start seeing each other. Uh, Dolly, you are uh, muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, um, I'm not sure. Do we have to write the question? No, you can, you can ask me now. If you had a well, question Dr. during the talk, I said, you know, just okay. type. Okay. Yeah. Well, Dr. Rao, thanks to you. You know, you've educated me on this. And uh, I have spoken to a Jain temple here in Houston, Texas. And because of that, they have made a lot of changes. They are using coconut oil to light the diva. They stopped giving milk to children on Sunday school. 
Um, they have not completely gone vegan, but uh, you've even spoken there. Right. So I think uh, they're on that path. Right. But I feel like, what do I need to do? What do I need to do more to make them start now? Uh, keep at it and okay. have, have patience because people are changing. It takes time for institutions to change. Uh, they need to get more and more pressure from the grassroots before they can change. Yes. Uh, and if you look at what happened in, at the Jaina conference, that was so encouraging because at the Jaina conference, when, I, uh, when we got there on Friday, uh, we had two lines for the lunch. There was a vegetarian line and a vegan line. Wow. And yeah, there were two separate lines for lunch. But during the uh, conference, we had talks by Philip Wallen, we had talks by um, Ingrid Newkirk, and then in the afternoon, I spoke, and then uh, Will Tuttle spoke. And the evening, the lines were gone. It was only one wow. single line. It was all wow. vegan. It was all vegan. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> right. And from that day onward, the conference was completely vegan. So amazing. it can be done. I mean, because basically when they heard, the organizers heard these talks, they realized that they are no longer in alignment with who, who they think they are. You know, so they decided that they yeah. had to take that step. And no one complained. Everyone was so fine true. with it, you know. I mean, they just got chai with the soy, soy milk and no one really cared yeah. you know, that it was different. Yeah. It's wonderful. Okay, so, uh, one question from Prashant. Um, Strictly addressing the environmental sustainability alone, minus ethics. What is your opinion about the sustainability of small scale Gaushala dairy farming? Okay, um, I have addressed this in my, uh, in my blogs. Um, I call it the, I mean, if you look at a blog article called the, uh, then the environmental footprint of milk, of Ahimsa milk. So the, I say the environmental footprint of Ahimsa milk is actually greater than that of beef. Uh, and I calculate that, assuming that we do not kill the, the male calves and we let the cows live until they die naturally. Okay? And then we let the calves drink the milk and we only take the excess milk for our consumption. So then every ounce of milk becomes so much more precious in terms of environmental resources because you, the cow had to eat a lot to produce that uh, ounce of milk. So this is why I think that um, uh, Gaushalas are actually going backwards uh, uh, in terms of environmental sustainability. Okay, what is the explanation um, behind animals being used as vehicles by God and goddesses? Yeah, there is a bit of uh, speciesism built into our stories. You know, naturally, in fact, unfortunately, speciesism is the original disconnect that we had uh, with nature. And um, that's the original disconnect that we need to overcome. So in fact, I, I have to be honest with you, uh, the stories that, I, that are in our uh, literature, in our culture, in our ethics, I cannot read them to my granddaughter. She objects to every one of the stories because of the abuse of animals that are in the stories. So Dasharatha goes around, goes to shoot a deer, right, in the, in the forest. In the first chapter itself, it talk, they talk about King Dasharatha shooting a deer, hunting in the forest. And she says, why is he shooting a deer? What's wrong with him? Okay, so she says, please don't tell me stories like that anymore. I don't want to hear it. So uh, there are all of our stories may have to be rewritten for the vegan uh, for the vegan world uh, because a lot of the abuse of animals are built in. So the environmental footprint of supplemental vitamin B12 been worked out, even the carbon footprint. Well, the supplemental vitamin B12 is it's a very small amount we need. You know, we are talking about micrograms. Um, per day. So I, it's, uh, I haven't really looked at the environmental footprint, but these are all the things that we need to be doing in the future is that we need to have a cost. The cost of all our products 
should be based on real costs, real environmental costs. What is the carbon dioxide footprint? What is the water footprint? What is the energy footprint of every product? And that should be there as the, it's a multidimensional cost of the product. And then we need, we need to be accounting for our overall environmental footprint, whether our overall carbon footprint, our overall water footprint, our overall energy footprint, or our overall phosphorus footprint, or nitrogen footprint, or whatever footprints you want, right? That we, we know that we are exceeding right now. That we need to have an overall budget and make sure that the accounting that we do for the cost will make sure that all of us together will never exceed our budget. But to me, you know, Civilization is an engineering project. It really is an engineering project because all of us are engineering our lives together to figure out how we live sustainably. And today, uh, this engineering project, our, engine our civilization is based on uh, marketing and lies and false costs. So this is why any engineering project that's based on marketing and lies will fail will blow up in our faces, just like the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up in our faces. So we have to redesign our civilization. We have to create a civilization, a new uh, vegan world in which everything is based on science and the truth and no longer based on marketing and lies. Only then will you reach a sustainable world. We talk about sustainability. Sustainability is based on the truth. It's based on love. Those are the only things that can be sustainable. What do, okay. May I speak a question about collaborating with ex-vegans? Certainly, Heather. Uh, okay, hello, Dr. Rao. Um, so I live up in Prescott and I run a holistic businesses group. Um, mm -hmm. And only one other person in our group, it's quite a large group, like 70 people, only one other person, uh, as well as my partner is vegan. and as well as the other organizers are not vegan, but many of them are ex-vegans, like they've been vegan before, um, but then they've said for health reasons or for something else, that they've decided not to be vegan anymore. Uh, right. And I'm not sure how to um, collaborate with them because they'll be um, you know, promoting steak or wanting to be promoting the consumption of animal products at our events. And I don't know what is the compassionate route. Do I just hold my tongue or how do I offer them information um, you know, and not, not be promoting um, what they're promoting because I, I want to see that transformation. It's very confusing to me um, that they would be in, this, in holistic health but be promoting this cruelty. <laughs> right. Um, you know, uh, I see the, um, I, I don't use the term ex-vegans at all or pre-vegans. I see everyone as vegan because if I ask people, would you deliberately hurt an innocent animal unnecessarily? Every one of them says, no, we would never do that. So I say then in your heart, you're already vegan. We are all vegan at heart. And so then what we do and what we say are not in alignment when we use animals, then we, um, we deliberately hurt animals in unnecessarily. So I say everyone is on a journey back home to who they really are. We are all on a journey back home to who we really are. And we do stumble on our journey, you know? So, so they have stumbled. They've tried to get, get on that journey and they've stumbled and we need to help them get back on the journey if they want to, right? So I normally just, you know, ask that question and let them figure out. Once I ask the question, they start wanting to know how to get back on the journey because they realize that they are not in alignment with who they really are, right? And so, then it becomes their journey and not us telling them to do something. Um, so uh, that's the way I handle it. Uh, but of course, I would never encourage them to eat food in front of me like that. You know, I would say I, it bothers me. You know, I mean, I really don't want to be around um, the abuse of animals. So those are things that you can say because that's what you feel. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, how do you handle questions on Lord Krishna or Mahavira consuming milk? Uh, or did they? Well, there are these are symbolic stories. Uh, these are symbolic stories. And so 
you know, I say milk is a fluid mind that has doubts about God. So he's consuming it and making sure that you don't, um, that you overcome that mind. So what's left is this solid. See, those days people were drinking milk as a matter of course, but they were drinking milk uh, because they thought it was essential for them because of the vitamin B12 issue, right? They thought it was essential to drink a little bit of milk. This is why everyone had a little bit of, uh, of milk sweets during festivals, a little bit of animal foods during festivals. And so uh, today, that same milk is toxic. It comes from uh, extreme animal abuse and it is unnecessary because we know about vitamin B12. We know what we were doing before is not correct. So, so we know that, you know, we have that, we have that awakening that happened in us so that we understand that there was this cobalt deficiency that was causing us to do this. And everything so now we can overcome that. Okay. Writing the questions. Good point, Hema, about uh, animals also being, uh, being used as vehicles should be looked at symbolically. Of course, yeah, no elephant could sit on a mouse <laughs> or a rat. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Vishnu did not need an eagle to be taken places. He's omnipresent. But it also, also sort of shows that we were using animals mm -hmm. um, to take us places because animals did help us to take, place, take us places uh, faster and um, uh, with less expenditure of our own energy. And that's what was normal during that time. Okay, consumption of cow's milk for the development of some tissues in the brain that apparently help in graining spiritual enlightenment. What is your view about that? Okay, first of all, if your desire for enlightenment is an impediment to enlightenment. So if you're drinking milk just to get that muscle that will grow you, that will get you to enlightenment, you already have a desire for enlightenment. Okay, number one. This is what the story of Karna is about. Because Karna, you know, was represented the desire for enlightenment, and he was fighting for the Kauravas, for the bad guys. Okay, uh, number one. Number two, knowing the toxins that are in the milk, if you drink it, you don't have. Uh, you know, uh, there is a lot of other things that you lack in your brain already. You know, I don't know how else to put it. You don't understand what's going on. There's so much toxins in the milk. If you're drinking it, thinking that it's going to grow some new brain. There's something wrong already. <laughs> okay. Also, one of the reasons why cow slaughter is prohibited in Hinduism is because of the usefulness of the cow for farming the land, for food, and cow dung for fuel. Some people suggest that fossil fuels are non-renewable. So what about the future of energy? Okay. So, yeah, we use uh, cow dung for fuel. We actually use more for manure. Okay. For fuel, uh, there is there is a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, if you look at the total amount of energy we need and you calculate uh, if it comes from just biomass, you don't have enough biomass on the earth to, to produce that much energy. So we have to figure out some way to reduce our energy use. So first of all, so we, this is why I say we need to first create this new civilization based on a new way of living based on, um, on kindness and compassion and that will automatically reduce us, reduce our energy requirement, okay? Because we are doing a lot of things today that are completely unnecessary. We take food, we feed it to animals, and then we wait for the animals to grow, and then we kill the animals. That's a lot of extra energy and extra, extra work that we're expending to get some food. So when we eliminate all these extra unnecessary uh, actions, our energy requirement decreases by an order of magnitude, okay? And at that point, it's much easier for us to tap it straight from solar energy and from wind energy. You know, it's much easier for us to do that than to rely on biomass for energy, number one. Um, number two, you know, the um, biomass that's being used as manure, um, it turns out again that, that if you just compost the original material, you get more manure or more soil than you would by taking the manure from a cow. So when you feed the biomass to a cow, 
almost 70% of that biomass gets metabolized. So it disappears as carbon dioxide into the air or it, go, it becomes part of the cow's muscles. So she grows with that food. Only 30% comes out of the manure. Okay, so that's a 30% efficiency of composting. So there's lots of vegan composting that achieve much better efficiency than that. Okay, so and you'll retain all the CO2 in carbon in the soil as opposed to sending it up in the air. Do you consider yeast as vegan? Well, uh, most people do, yeah, do, do consider yeast as vegan. It's, it's basically like bacteria. Minimalism, yes, absolutely. That's what the true, uh, this is what veganism will eventually become because veganism is about not hurting animals unnecessarily. And you discover that every product you consume does impact some animal somewhere. So then you get to a point where you keep asking, do I really need this product? Do I need to buy this? Do I need to consume this? And very soon you, get, you drop them all and you discover that you're getting happier and happier and happier as you do that which is the benefit of uh, this, uh, this uh, journey that we are on, okay? So you start dropping your needs and you discover that you're getting happier and happier. Well, if there are no other questions, oh, you have a question, Dolly, go for it. Yes, yes. How do we help Goshalas? I have two questions. How do we help Goshalas become sanctuaries right and question two how do we help farmers in india um you know plant plant-based milks and mm -hmm. take care of the cows that they have no longer breed them and help them grow something else how are we going to help this how do we start doing this yeah this is the um you know this is the kind of work that uh, that renee has been doing yes Renee, Renee King Sonner has been doing. So basically help them grow mushrooms if they, instead of growing chickens or so help them, uh, you know, grow almond trees or, you know, or cashew trees instead of raising cows so that they have a, another source of income in the current system. See the yeah. current system, if you don't do any of that, you will get zero money and you're going to starve to, die, to death if you don't work like that. In the new system, we're talking about a minimum basic income so that people can decide how can I contribute to society than what we're doing today. Uh, I use the analogy of um, Michelangelo and David. You know, when Michelangelo finished carving David, he wasn't worrying, up, I mean, he wasn't really being, you know, very upset about all the shards of marble that was lying on the floor. Uh, he was using a hammer and chisel to carve David and you know, he had to clean up that marble too. So which means it's a different set of actions he had to do. And for cleaning up the marble, he could not do it with a hammer and chisel. He had to use a bucket and a shower. So we have finished our David. We have finished doing something. We have finished, um, creating this thermostat for the planet so that we don't ever have to go back to another ice age again. So now that we have finished the David, which is the, the climate regulation mechanism for the planet, we need to clean up the mess we have made. And to do that, we need a bucket and a shower. We need to organize differently, right? So that's the story I use. So which is what this transformation is about. This is what the vegan transformation is about. It, it really, vegan transformation is saying to the current system, you're done. We can no longer continue the way we are doing things. We can no longer rely on violence towards animals. Thank you. You've been saying in many talks, uh, Dharmada, in many talks, violence is not sustainable. Nature sustains itself by interspecies violence. Yeah, how would you account for the violence that seems to be central to the natural world? In non religions, there's so much violence, war and destruction. You're correct, um, violence is part of nature, but uh, what I'm pointing out is that our biomass as humans has, is so unnatural. It has exceeded the biomass of all the wild animals that lived 
10,000 years ago by now a factor of 2.5. So if you want to have a system in which we do survive, we do thrive as we are, we have to become non-violent. I mean, the other animals can be violent to each other. That's, that's, their, that's, the, way they, that's the way the ecosystem works. But we, as a homo sapiens, have to become homo ahimsa, homo non-violent, for us to thrive in this um, ecosystem. And we have a lot of work to do, too. See, the animals cannot clean up the radiation. Animals cannot clean up the toxic pollution. You know? So there's a lot of work that we, only we can do. Animals are dying of cancer today. Okay? And so they're depending on us to clean up the environment. Otherwise, they're also going to die off. Yeah, how do we respond to the plants feel pain from the Hindu perspective? Yes, plants, if, let's say plants feel pain, then, but we also know that when we cut a plant and um, then the plant grows where you cut it, actually the plant regenerates in, in a faster than where we cut it. So this is called pruning of a plant. So we can prune plants and eat them and they grow, they thrive because we do that. So we're helping the plants thrive, number one. Number two, if we, use, if we eat animals because we think that plants feel pain, we're actually causing more pain to the plants because the animals are eating a lot more plants to grow themselves than we would have eaten by ourselves. Yes, Dolly. Um, so Dr. Rao, a lot of times when I give lectures on why dairy is not ahimsa, people will come back and say to me, well, if India goes vegan, we'll have an overpopulation of dairy cows. What are right. we going to do with all these cows? How do I answer right. them? Well, we should stop. First of all, we should, the number one thing we should do is stop producing new cows. Yes. Okay. When we stop producing new cows, naturally, the current, in the current system, there's so many cows being eaten already. They're being killed and eaten. I mean, there's so many, I think 15% or 16% of the cows are being killed every year in, the, in India. Okay. So at yeah. that rate, you know, they're, they're going to wipe out all the cows within six years anyway. You know, that's the rate at which we are killing them. Okay. So we need to just say our community is not going to kill cows. Our community is going to um, stop producing cows and we need to protect the cows. Right. And then yeah. automatically as more and more people stop eating, then they will, stop producing. They should stop producing. That's one of the problems we have today is that uh, even though we have stopped eating, the producers are still producing with the because the government is buying the extra milk and the excess, cheese, excess okay. cheese and the excess meat and storing it in warehouses and dumping it. Okay? That's our government. Man. These people are not really you know, representing us anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm going to stop the recording. Um...